so here we are. Today is the second day of December. And so that means, amen. Somebody really wanted to end or whatever that is, but hey, praise the Lord. But we, we made it through, and it's Christmas. We just had Thanksgiving. Uh, many folks were traveling. Glad that you guys are back. Uh, so many folks were out for the holidays. So I trust and pray that you indeed had a blessed Thanksgiving season, and now let's wind it down appropriately. So God is good. Have you been blessed this year? 11 months. Has God been faithful to you? He has been good, and so I praise him for that. So I'm here today to remind us that in Christ we are richly blessed. For so many different reasons we are blessed. We can all say something on behalf of what God has done for us and what he actually is continuing to do for each and every one of us. So this morning, I want to take you back. I know before Thanksgiving we talked about some of the blessings that God gave to us. And so I want to spend one more message in that vein this morning and share with you from the title, God's Final Blessings to Planet Earth. God's final blessings to planet Earth. Let us pray. Loving God and eternal Father, we bless you and thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will continue to do in each and every one of our lives. We want to thank you there, God, that as we look towards finishing 2017, that we can have hope, the blessed hope. You have been with us all through this year, and so we are confident, Lord, that you will be with us for the remainder of this year. As we set our eyes on a new year, however, we ask that your Holy Spirit may continue to birth a thirst and a desire for righteousness, holiness, and for that eternal kingdom, for heaven. In Jesus' name, be with us as we study your word. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. Whenever you read a book or watch a movie, the beginning of the movie or the beginning of the, um, the book is important, and also the end. Have you ever had the experience where maybe you came in on a movie in the middle, somewhere there, and you try to figure out, well, what happened in the beginning? Because there's some suspense going on, there's so many things happening, and you're like, you try to, you're trying to connect the dots because you didn't catch the beginning, so you don't know what's happening. Sometimes, if you saw the beginning, and you see the suspense developing, you don't really always have to see the end because you can kind of figure out where it's going. It's like, uh, some movies are so predictable too, right? You, and you kind of get upset because you really, I'm like, come on, man, this is so, you know, can it be different? You know, it's so predictable. So the same thing with books, right? Books, sometimes you can kind of predict how it's going to end because of what's happening. But if you did not get the introduction, if you did not get the beginning, it's kind of hard to ascertain the end. What I love about God, though, is this. He gave us the Bible. And we have, if you just read Genesis, you have all that you need for the gospel. If you read Exodus, you have the gospel. No matter which book you open, you can find the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I love about, about God. However, what I love about our faith group especially is I believe we are CIA. We are the Central Intelligence Agency. Because we have privileged knowledge and information, Gonzo, on how it's going to end. And so if I already know how it's going to end, then the middle, leading up towards that end, we can kind of work ourselves in because we already have the preview. There's no surprises at the end. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there should be no surprises at the end. Why? Because... <laughs> He already gave us the blueprint. He already gave us a snippet, a preview of life's coming attraction. And so I want to remind us today that if you know how it's going to end, then let us prepare ourselves for the great finale. What do you say? Let us be part of the movie. Let's not just watch the movie. Let's actually be in it. And so let us end it together and let us share with the world the blessings because here's the thing. Some people think, you know, God blessed Abraham in Genesis and so that's it. That's the end of it. And through Abraham, all the blessings come down to all of us. And it's like, is that all? 
Jesus came on the scene and he pronounced blessing. He went on the Sermon on the Mount and he started talking about blessed, 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 blessed. And he was just blessing everybody. And we said, praise the Lord. But Jesus died and he rose again. Praise the Lord. That's blessing. But he went back to heaven and the disciples didn't leave no blessing for us. They didn't pronounce any blessings nowhere because they were in the drama. They were in the action. They were going. They were moving. But I praise God in the last book and even down to the very last chapter. Jesus himself comes back on the scene, and he says, since my disciples didn't give any blessings, I'm here to give you a perfect benediction. Seven blessings. My final blessings in my book for planet Earth. Isn't that good news? So he came to John, but he didn't leave it up to John. John did not give the blessings. Jesus gave the blessings. Are we all there? So let's go now to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And again, we are privileged because we know already it opens with the revelation of whom, everybody? Of Jesus Christ, who God the Father gave a revelation to us, his servants. Are you a servant this morning? If you are his servants, then God is giving a benediction to you and to me. And it's our job to pass that down, Dr. Smith to the rest of humanity. And so I'm looking at this now, and I'm getting excited because it now says, John bore record. It means, therefore, if he is bearing record, he is not the one giving the testimony. He is the one receiving the testimony because it is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the reason he is giving this, he says, because the end or the time is at hand. The time is at hand. So in other words, if we look at it and we took it in context to say, for example, as an illustration, if 2017 is about to end and the end of the year is at hand, what benediction can we give, right? Jesus gave a benediction for the end of the world, but we are approaching the end of the year. And for many people, this will be their final year. And so that's why we should always give the message of God's blessing to humanity with a sense of urgency. Because so many people did not make it, actually, even today. There are some folks that have died today, and before the day ends, there will be others who will die. Some, praise God, when we get to Revelation 20, they will receive a blessing, but others will not be part of that blessing. And so that's why I want you to be generous, because God is generous. He dishes out blessings freely. And you and I have the capacity to do it, but sometimes we don't give the blessing. So let's get in here, Dr. Flores, and let's now go through some of these blessings, this benediction that God has. Are you ready? Number one, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Can someone read it for me, please? Revelation 1 and verse number 3. Because the time is at hand, God now is saying, hey, blessed, but he qualifies it. And remember, we said blessing does not just simply mean happy. doesn't make sense. What he's saying is, you are fortunate, Wani. How lucky and privileged you are. That's the connotation of the word. You are, you are favored of God. You are blessed beyond measure to have this happen to you. You are fortunate. You are privileged. So in other words, the the, the original has this connotation of congratulations. Congratulations. Congrats to you who read my word, who hear it. Are you reading it today? Are you hearing it today? But the last part that qualifies it, if you want the blessing, he said, now we must also do, apply, live out that which we have read and heard. Amen? Amen. So if people want to be blessed, you pronounce the blessing on them because when you read to them the Bible, John, you ought to say, this is the word of God to you. See, that's what we don't like. We don't personalize it for people. This is God speaking to you personally. And he is saying, you are blessed, you are favored. I give congratulatory remarks upon you because you are hearing the word of the Lord. Because in many parts of the world, there are people who don't have the word of God, right? And so even today with multitudinous churches, it's still a famine in the land. 
We have a church block uh, up on every block. Sometimes you have multiple churches. Actually, if you go up on just Ware Road, you're going to find almost seven churches on Ware Road. And yet, our nation is still morally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt, and all of these different things, and we are actually biblically illiterate more than ever. And yet, we have it on the internet, we have it on the news, we have newspaper, magazines, all of these things with the word of God in it, and yet there's a famine in the land. What a travesty. The problem is, even though we have the word of God, people are still not reading it and hearing it. That's the problem. Because many of you, like myself, have at least seven to eight. I think I got about pushing ten Bibles at home, right? And the thing is, how often do we actually read it? It sits on the shelf as one of our, you know, what you call those decorations. So people come over, here's my Bible. Some folks say, now we, we, we have it like cereal. You want, I got the King James, the New King James, the NIV, the L, N, NLT. And we have everything. All the different versions. I got it in different colors. I got everything that you need. It's like, you know, it's, it's a brand. But the word of God needs to be listened to, to be heard, and to be experienced. When people live out the word of God, they cannot help but be blessed. And so here it is, people are saying, I don't feel blessed. The year is ending. I don't have no money to buy Christmas gifts. Hey, listen, if you got the word of God, you are blessed for the holidays. Right? And, I, and that's a good thing. That's a good cop-out, by the way. Don't tell them the pastor said it. But if you don't got no money to buy folk stuff in the holidays, give them one of your free Bibles that you got at home. And tell them you are blessed. Go ahead and read Revelation chapter 1. Seriously. You are blessed and you are highly favored because if you read it, you will be like me. You will be a CIA. You will be an agent of change and transformation, and you will know secret things that belongs to God. That is the blessing that God wants us to receive today. That's just number one. He has some more. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14 now. Revelation chapter 14. So all that's happening in between now. So Jesus, this is how Jesus preaches. No, you notice, on the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus got on the mountain, he sat down, and unlike the rest of the leaders who want to pronounce damnation and do all these different things, Jesus came saying, blessed are you, blessed are you. Jesus was blessing the poor people. Jesus was blessing the prostitutes. Jesus was blessing all the people that the church didn't consider blessed. And so here it is now. Even before he got into all these beasts and symbols and all of these things, Jesus is pronouncing blessing. See how Jesus teaches? He comes first and he gives you the good news. But the good news comes, there's responsibility behind it. Eh? But some of us, we just want to bring all, hey, you got to do all of this first. Hey, where's the blessing? Tell me about the blessing. I want to hear the laws of God. Yes, but even when God gave the law, he said, I am the Lord God who delivered you out of the house of bondage, out of the house of Israel. He did all of this. I delivered, I mean, Egypt, yes, <laughs> Egypt. I delivered you. And because I did this, now, 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 have no other gods before me. Now, be faithful to me. Now, now. So now we say, before I give you all this symbolic meaning of these beasts and people are getting scared and so forth, we got to tell them, hey, you are fortunate. Congratulations if you can understand these things. You are privileged and highly favored of God to know what you are about to discover. What a blessing. So now all of the things that's happening in between now, he comes on chapter 2 and 3, and Jesus begins to now explain. He sends messages to his churches, right? This is benediction. And then he explains what's going to happen. So he didn't leave us clueless. In chapter 4 and 5, we have this heavenly scene where people now and angels and, and these elders, they're bowing down and they're worshiping Almighty God. What a blessing. And then there's a sad situation in chapter 5. How can you be in the presence of God and be sad? So John now is beginning to weep because he said, there's this book, there's this scroll, and no one is worthy in heaven, in earth, and under the earth to open it. But the angels, ah, oh, no, they John. You're in a heavenly vision, my brother. We don't cry up in here. It's good news. Hold on, hold on. And so he said, Jesus, the lamb that was slain, is worthy. John, stop crying. Tell people, stop crying. Jesus is dead, but he has risen again, and he is alive. We don't serve the God of the dead. We serve the God of the living. So don't weep, John. Somebody is worthy. 
And then Jesus now begins to open these seals. And again, in the middle of the seals, now we find some problems. There's some terrible news going on there. And so chapter 6 now goes into unveiling these seals. And then here we go, chapter 6, verse 18, the Bible says, and who shall be able to stand? Because we read from 12 to 17 that people are running to the hills. Whatever, whatever was unveiled in the seals, people are running to the hills and mountains say, fall on us. That's not good news. That's not exciting. What's wrong? Something went wrong somewhere. So now the question is, who shall be able to stand? Chapter 7 says, oh, hold on. John, let me tell you who will be able to stand. The Bible says, he told these angels holding back the winds of strife, hold it until my servants are sealed in their forehead. Isn't that good news? Yeah? That's good news. People don't have to be scared or worried about all these things. Matter of fact, all the destruction that's happening, God is still not letting the angels let it all go. So the thing is, we are still privileged in the midst of tragedy. And so people should be praising God even in the midst of, because here's what we should tell them. God is giving you an opportunity to change. He's given you an opportunity to be sealed. Do you want to be sealed? Right? And so we go into these trumpets and so forth, but then by the time we go through the great disappointment and so forth, then he tells us who this beast power is that will make havoc against God's people in the end of time. And then now Revelation 14 opens up with this beautiful, beautiful picture of three angels flying in the midst of heaven, giving what we call the everlasting gospel, which is so good, so great for planet Earth because no one else is giving this particular message. But there's a little tragedy. Because when you preach the three angels' messages, you can lose your life. So the next benediction is found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Can someone read that for me, please? Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. And their works do follow them. Praise God. So when the people are preaching the gospel, remember 14 starts out with these three angels' messages. Planet Earth has an opportunity to repent and to change and to escape the wrath that is to come. God is saying, come out of all my people. He is actually calling his people. Eh? It, that's, that's very important. He's not calling strangers. He said, my sheep. They hear my voice, they know my voice, and they follow me. Tell people to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, wherever he bids you. Sometimes he might tell you, come out of one fold and come into the, his true fold. So follow him. You're not following me, you're not following the church, you're following Christ, you're following the Lamb, because he has a blessing. But let me let you know, my brothers and sisters, some of us, we will lose loved ones in the process. You might lose your life, I may lose my life, but the scripture declares that we are blessed, 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 even if we lose our life for the sake of the gospel that we believe in and the sake of the gospel that we preach. You will not lose your reward either. Because he said, your works follow you. In other words, everything is sealed. Everything is good. And so remember, remember, comfort people with these words that even in death, we can still have hope because we will not lose our reward. That's good news as we close out the year. Comfort yourself. Many of us have had tragedy. Even in this church, we've had tragedy for this year. But be comforted knowing the fact that God has pronounced a blessing upon those loved ones because he said they are blessed. They have received the blessing. And so now, 15 goes into, because remember chapter 16 now, I mean chapter 14, the three angels' message have already been preached. Chapter 15 now, people have already made their response. You know, in the end of 14, it says that, you know, throw in the, the sickle for the harvest is ripe. That's the reaping of the earth. Then we now know probation is closed in chapter 15. Chapter 16 now is when we find the next blessing. Because now, here it is. These seven last plagues are being poured out upon planet Earth. They're being poured out, and again, many people are afraid of this. But why should we be afraid? Should God's people be afraid? No, no, no. We should not be afraid. Why? Because chapter 7 already told us something. It says, hold back the winds of strife until my servants are sealed in their foreheads. If you are sealed by the living God, it doesn't matter what plagues are coming upon the face of the earth. We will be in the middle of it if you are alive, but it shall not come nigh thee. This is good news. Tell them before the plagues are poured out, make sure your calling and election is indeed sure. 
Make sure you are standing on the right side. But here's the thing. As they go through giving, John is going through now, talking about these seven last plagues. In the middle of the sixth plague, it's like, hold on, hold, hold on, John. Hold on. I think there's too much, too much drama happening here. Let's slow down the story because let's comfort somebody. John, somebody is going to be reading right now. And they're not going to get it. They're going to be like, oh, my, I don't, am I going to be living through all of this? No, he said, hold on. Let me give them a little, little benediction and we come back to the rest of the story. Can we do that? So in the middle of the sixth trumpet, he said, hold on. Before you announce number seven, let me give another blessing. Someone read for me Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 15. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Because Jesus now, he knows that he's going to make an entrance soon. Because remember, it's all downhill from here on out. 15, probation closes. 16, announce the trumpet. 17 and 18 tells us what's going to happen to the beast. Chapter 19, Jesus comes. 20, it's all gone. Right? So now he's saying, I need to give another encouragement. What is the encouragement? Somebody read for me. 16, 15. Mm-hmm. All right, so now Jesus is saying, Gonzo, listen, there is coming a day of reckoning. Be careful because I'm coming as a thief. In other words, we know that when Jesus comes, it's going to be a surprise for those who did not make preparation. Because before he left, he told his disciples to what? Watch and pray. Be ready. The problem is we keep getting ready. He didn't say get ready. He says to be ready. We should always be ready because you never know if this might be your last moment, this might be your last month, this is your last season. You do not know. So therefore, be ready always. Stop getting ready and be ready. Too much getting ready. We keep getting ready. That's why we're holding up this party. Because 19 is the party, but they say Jesus is so patient with us. But my brothers and sisters, you and I are the ones holding up this wedding feast. We need to get ready and stay ready. Don't take forever to get ready. But I know if every wedding, the bride is always taking her time. Yeah? The bride we got, but, but praise the Lord, that's how faithful he is, right? Because who can start a wedding without the bride anyhow? So even if all, all the visitors are ready, if the bride ain't ready, there ain't no wedding. <laughs> so, you got, so, you, so sometimes in the military, they used to tell us, hurry up and wait. <laughs> Right? So it's like we're not going anywhere anytime soon, Mr. Chan. So hurry up and wait. So we have to wait. But nonetheless, while we are waiting, let's get ready. Let's do something and be ready for Jesus' second coming. So let me look at you. Let's look at this now. What is he saying here? What is he saying here? So he's saying that don't be caught off guard. Don't be caught naked. All right? We, wanna, one, we don't want to give too much illustration on that. But have you ever had a situation where, let's just say, maybe you invited a guest over. And then they come over, and you thought they were coming at 4, right? And they came maybe at 2, and you probably in the shower getting ready. You know, you know, they caught you off guard a little bit. It's like, man, I thought you were coming at this time. You know, your house is not ready. You, still, you were hoping that by 3.30 you'll be cleaning up. Sometimes Jesus come before we expect, guys, let's be careful. Because if you die, it's as though he came. What is this garment that he's talking about? He's not talking about our physical clothes, is he? He's not talking about this, is he? Let's t let me take you back a little bit to Zechariah. Zechariah gives us a wonderful illustration of this. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3 real quick. Remember the story of the vision of Joshua. Joshua was a high priest, right? And he was standing before the Lord. You see, God is saying... By this time, my people are making preparation to stand in my presence. But you cannot stand in his presence in a certain type of garment. All right? So God is faithful and just, but let me tell you, he wants to save you from sin and your rubbish. He don't want you to remain in your rubbish. He wants to purify us. He wants to make us clean. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, because the devil was accusing now. The devil was accusing, right? Um, the fact that here we have the high priest of all people, clothed in filthy garments, trying to stand before God. And the devil was right. Yeah, I'll be blaming the devil for a lot of things. The devil knows his scripture. The devil knows his Bible better than many of us. So the devil is saying, hold on, I thought this was heaven. How is it that you are letting this, even though he is your high priest, how come he's standing in your presence in filth? Who is the accuser of the brethren? 
Satan is the accuser of the brethren. This is why you and I need to think deeply about this stuff. You see, God's grace cleanses and covers, and God wants to transform us. But sometimes we make a mockery of that grace because the devil is constantly trying to make accusations. God, these people are filthy. And he is right. We are. Because we want to come any old how into the presence of God. My brothers and sisters, but don't be discouraged. If that's the way you got to come, come anyhow. Because here's what the Bible says concerning Zechariah. It says, and he answered, verse 4, and spake unto those that stood by before him, saying what? Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caught. Notice he said, Your garment was filthy, but guess what happened? Notice what the filth is. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with what? A change of raiment, a change of what? A change of garments. I'm taking away this filthy one, and I'm giving you a better one. Now, Mr. Devil, you laugh on that one. Amen? So when the devil likes to tell you about your filthiness and unrighteousness, you got to point to Jesus and say, have you seen his robe lately? My robe is in filth, but have you seen his robe? And by the way, his robe is mine. Oh, y'all didn't get this. Thank you, brother. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Hopefully that one will sink in, right? In the multitude of two or three witnesses. So let's get you another witness. Isaiah chapter, <laughs> chapter 61. Isaiah 61, and I want to look at the 10th verse. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse number 10. Now, let me back up and give you a little, little bit here. Um, verse number 9, it says, And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people, and all that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has done what everybody? Blessed. Amen. Are you a Gentile? All right. In Christ, we're we, we spiritual Israel too. But hey, all of us are Gentiles in some way, shape, or form. I don't really care. Gentile, Jew, whatever we are, here's the thing. In Christ, we are all joint heirs together. So it doesn't matter which side of the equation you fall on. You just say, the blood of Jesus Christ has made me a joint heir. I am a son and daughter of God, baby. I am a son and daughter of God. Amen? So you give people that. That's good news. You can be a son and daughter. It doesn't matter what your background, your race is, nothing like that. Because look at what he does for you. Verse 10. This is the punchline now. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall what? Be joyful in my God. Did you get that? They are joyful. They are rejoicing. Why? For he has clothed me with what? The garment of what? And he has covered me with what? What kind of robe, my brothers? As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a what? Bride adorns herself. God is saying, listen, when you accept me, filthy though you may be, you cannot remain the same. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. He washes us. He cleanses us. He purifies us. He says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you. But I don't just want to forgive you. I want to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. My brothers and sisters, when we are clean, that makes us clean. In the Hebrew, clean means clean. In Greek, clean means clean. Clean. No matter which language you put it in, clean is clean. If God cleanses you, you are clean. Whatever tongue you want to use for it, that's all right. But clean is clean. And you can't improve upon God's clean, by the way. When God cleans you up, I mean white today, but if you, you know, whatever this color is, but it, you can probably find a little bit of something here if you look close enough. But when you look at the robe of Christ's righteousness, you're not going to find anything. So that's why you got, yes, when the devil look at you and me, we are, because we are going through a sanctification process, see, that's the problem, you see. The devil still got some little loopholes that he can identify because we're still going through. But that's why you don't, you don't present your own stuff. Somebody says, when the devil come knocking on your door, send King Jesus. Send Jesus to answer. Why are you answering? Because he's going to be correct in his estimation of you. So you send Jesus. Have you seen Jesus' robe lately? I know I got a little bit of a dirt on mine, Mr. Devil, today, but guess what? I'm going back for a washing. Amen? I'm going back for washing. Keep going to, for, to Christ for this washing. So this is the thing on chapter 16. So now, remember, Jesus is about to come. 
These plagues are being poured out, but he's now again reminding us, listen, I am coming as a thief, therefore get your garments together. Not your own garments. You must be cleansed with my and covered with my own garments. My garments of righteousness. My garments of salvation. You must come to Christ to be saved. And then Christ now, through his sanctifying work, he purifies you. And this must happen before we get to the next one. Number 19 now. So this is 16, 17, and like I said, 17 and 18 goes into more of Babylon. What's going to be Babylon's judgment, right? And now we go into 19. Oh, I love 19. Chapter 19 is the loudest chapter in the entire Bible, right? So many hallelujahs are happening in chapter 19. We saw that already, right? Because by this time, remember now, we, the Babylon has already been judged. This, the plagues have already passed. And so now here we're looking at this situation now. John is seeing again this multitude. It starts off with heaven, people in heaven, praising the Lord, hallelujah, and amen, and they're so happy. And then he looks again, Sonia, and he sees another group of people. That's you and me, sister. That's you and me. By faith, we are standing there, amen? So when you read Revelation next time, say, there I am, I'm saying that, hallelujah, and amen. I know sometime in the church, you know, praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. We don't like to say it out loud, but here's the thing. When you stand on that sea of glass, you can't be quiet. You, you will not be quiet. You will be so shocked that you made it there. You got to give a look. I made, I made it. I'm, oh, I'm here. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and by that time, it will be good. And that's a good word, right? Hallelujah, right? It's a good Hebrew word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's all right. It's not a sin. It's not a sin. I know sometimes we don't like it, but let me tell you, we're going to be saying it. So if you don't want to praise the Lord now, he's going to get that glory, Sister Martha, out of you when he gets on that glass, you see. Because you're going to be praising the Lord. I'm going to see Nolan and Reagan there. They praise the Lord. Quiet Nolan. Nolan might be the loudest over there, saying hallelujah and amen. But now let's jump down to verse number nine. Someone read for me verse number nine. So now the Bible shifts. After we see all this hallelujah, we understand why. Because now there's a party. This is the party. This is the wedding now. The wedding is finally taking place. Number nine, can someone read? Who has it? Number nine. Yes, ma'am. Oh, praise the Lord. Blessed are you who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Read the next one, please. See, John was so happy. Right in chapter 5, he was falling down, weeping and crying. He couldn't stand what was happening. Now he sees this wonderful situation. Everybody is praising the Lord. John even want to praise the angels. He said, man, I just, I just want to fall down and worship somebody. Everything is happening. He said, hold on, hold on. I know you're happy, John. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't get Pentecostal up in the kingdom. Just hold on a second. Only worship God, all right? I know you're happy, but please direct all worship to him. But John is so excited because the Bible says the bride has made herself ready. That's why we have this party going on, and that's why he's pronouncing the blessing. Because finally, finally, the thing that he's been waiting for, this bridegroom has been gone for 2,000 years, and the bride's still getting ready. What a, what a party it is going to be. Right? Because remember, they have a little mini celebration because heaven will be kind of quiet, but there has mini celebration. Because the Bible says, as we are preaching the three angels' message, what happened, every time somebody gets saved, there's a hallelujah party in heaven. Right? Because they got to keep the excitement going until we get ready. So he said, in the meantime, we can't wait that long. 2,000 years before we get some jubilation in the kingdom? No way. We're going to have a little party, but it's not going to be close near to when my bride gets ready. Because all these ones that are being saved are going to be part of the bridal party. Do you want to be there? Guys, my friends, you are invited to the wedding party. Furthermore, it's not just that you are invited. You are the bride. We are the bride. Isn't that a privilege? So now do you understand what we said? Is that just being happy? He's saying, congratulations. Blessed are you. You made it into the kingdom. We're ready for this marriage now. Because remember now, 
he's getting to 20 and 21, right? 21, we talk about that kingdom, that new Jerusalem coming down and so forth. Because the marriage has taken place, the consummation has taken place. He says, now I'm bringing my bride into my house. Praise the Lord. Hey, that's why young people, we talked about this last week. That's why you got to wait and be ready. Make sure that man or woman get a home before, you know. Marry me first before we get into that house. Amen. Even Jesus has given us marriage principles in the end of time. Jesus is saying, I'm getting married to my bride, but she can't come to my house yet because she, everybody ain't ready. So he said, I'm going to take my time. Let my bride be ready. He's not forcing. He's not pushing. Even though he's anxious. Don't get, don't get me wrong. He's anxious. But 2,000 years of waiting, if a man can't wait for a while, you better let him go. You better let him go. You said, Jesus is waiting on me. What's wrong with you? Well, he said, I ain't got 2,000 years, but nonetheless, you're still a young man, all right? So young people, that's just a free one there, right? Jerash, hold on, and you can wait a little bit longer. Let them wait because Jesus is waiting for you, and Jesus is setting an example that he's going to take us to his father's house. He's preparing the bride chambers for you and for me. Matter of fact, again, don't worry if you don't have a big house down here, you're going to have a mansion there. Amen. Amen? Don't worry if you're not rich here, it's all right. We're going to walk on streets of gold, Amen. You see, many of us are wasting our lives and people are struggling. Someone told a story that there was a rich salesman, right? This rich salesman became a Christian. Someone shared the three angels' message with him. So when they shared this rich uh, story with him, you know, someone told him. I don't know who told him. I think it might have been, you know, it's not somebody in our faith group. But they said, listen, you can bring several things to the kingdom. You can only bring two bags in the kingdom of heaven. He said, two bags? We can bring two bags? Really? Bam. He's a salesman. So what he did, man, he went out and he sold everything, Sister Smith. He was selling left, right, and center. And he started accumulating more and more money, right? And so as he accumulates all these funds, he went out and he said, okay, what am I going to take to heaven, man? Wow. I know what? I read in the Bible all about this gold and all this stuff. He said, I'm going to take me some bag of gold up into the kingdom of heaven. So he went out and he bought all of this gold and he had two sacks coming in. And so as he came up to to the gate now, the pearly gates, gate number seven, that's the perfect one. He said, I ain't going to 11, I'm going to number seven. Certainly I'm in. So as he gets there, Peter meets him. He said, welcome, Mr. Salesman. You made it into the kingdom of God. You are blessed. So what did you bring with you? Pull up, he said, yeah, I spent all my time, all my energies, and I hear uh, my two bags of gold. Peter looked at him confused, like, Who told you that? Why would you labor so hard on earth to bring pavement into the kingdom? <laughs> we already, we're going to, you, you're going to, look, look over here. You're going to be walking on gold. I'm sorry. We, we, we don't need that gold up in here. We already have enough gold. Listen, my brothers and sisters, what are you trading your life, your time for? You cannot take it to the kingdom of heaven with you. The only thing he wants there is your character. He wants you to be there. So don't waste your time struggling to get all these things that's going to burn up anyhow. If you can get it, fine. But don't stress and waste your time and energies about it. Don't be discouraged, depressed, and defeated about it. No, you seek God and his kingdom and his righteousness first. And he says, all these things shall be added unto you. That's not only for now. That's for eternity as well. He said, don't worry about it. And by the way, praise God, if you can get a good education, we believe our young people should get a good education. But nobody's going to call you Dr. So in the kingdom of heaven, PhD So. We don't go by titles in the kingdom of heaven. Matter of fact, he said, I don't want nothing from this earth, Philip. Because I'm giving all y'all a new name. Because if you come up in here with your name being uh, Sister Duncan, you come up in here being Lilani, there's too much baggage with that name. So I'm going to give you guys too much, a new, whole new name. Because you know you have the experience where sometimes you're looking on your phone, you get a phone call, and you see the name. Oh, boy. You get it? Sometimes you just see the name. Oh, man, someone's, I don't want to baggage associated with certain names. So God says he's going to give us a new name, praise the Lord. He don't want our earthly names. He don't want your earthly titles. Yeah? He wants us to have one name, and he's going to give each and every one of us a name, Neil. And so just be prepared, Neil. Don't get too attached to your name. Be happy to know that God is going to give you a new one, and that's the good news. If you don't like your name, hold on. God is going to give you a new one. 
All right? Let's look at the last two blessings real quick. Now we finish with that. Now we, the very next chapter now, because it's all done. The rest of chapter 19 tells us that Jesus now changes his garment, right? He takes off that priestly garment, and he puts on his garment of royalty, kingship, leadership, and he's coming now to get his people. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, this is some good stuff. This is some good stuff. Jesus is now coming to get his people because the bride is ready. Everything is prepared. The welcome party, the welcome table is all there. And so now we have a situation. Chapter 20 opens up. This will be known as the beginning of the millennium. The 1,000 years. And we would hope that everybody would go. But unfortunately, everybody didn't. Can someone read for me real quick? Verse number six, five and six. Let's, re, let's get a context, five and six. This is the sixth blessing, by the way. Fifth one, we get, we get to others real quick. Yeah? Quickly, somebody read for me. Amen. Hallelujah. And shall reign with him a thousand years. My brothers and sisters, if you die in the Lord or if you die, period, which resurrection you want to, you want to be in? Number one or number two? And by the way, if you didn't make it up in number one, you just, you just really didn't make it at all. So there's no surprise. But I'm telling you, why settle for number two when we can be number one? We're number one. Get up in the first resurrection. Why? Because those who rise in the first resurrection are those who will be with Almighty God. These are the ones who will not perish by the lake of fire because the second resurrection is for those who unfortunately did not get the benediction. What a tragedy. To know how it's going to end and yet you miss out. To know that Jesus is pleading and giving all of these blessings and still not make it. You know, I prayed the other night. I said, Lord, because we all go through some stressful moments. I was having a stressful moment. I said, you know what, Lord? Just save me in your kingdom. Just save me. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just got to say, Lord, all of this we're stressing about. Why? I just want to be in your kingdom. If that's all you can pray, pray and say, God, do not allow me to miss out on heaven. I mean, it's like a double whammy. We had misery on this earth and to miss the kingdom of heaven too. The first resurrection, I want to be in it. I want to come up among the righteous, the righteous, the one who gave their life for Christ the one who submitted to his call, the one who believed in the gospel message and accepted his righteousness and not their own. These are the ones who will rise when Jesus comes again. Brothers and sisters, plead with other people that they do not come up in the second resurrection. That is eternal separation from Almighty God. Hell was not prepared for you and me. It was not prepared for us. Why allow the devil to cause you to be in the lake of fire with him? Please, this holiday season, people are going to be missing the mark. They talk about Christ, but nonetheless, we don't hear Christ, see him, see him anywhere. But remind them as they come to your house and as you go places and as you give gifts, don't forget to give them the gospel, the news, the good news. Holiday without that is nothing. You've got to give them the most important thing. Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. The truth is what people need. People are suffering and dying. Their eternal destinies are hinged upon this good news. Tell it to them. Give it to them however you can. But don't forget to remind them there are blessings. Blessed are those who come up in the first resurrection. Because guess what? Death has nothing on them. Praise God. Death will be swallowed up in victory. We will overcome. This is what overcomes? Faith is the victory. Faith in Christ for what he has done. 
We can overcome. We don't have to perish. No one has to perish. Why perish? He says, listen, I gave my only begotten son. If you believe in me, you shall not perish. Why perish? It is so simple. You don't need a degree. You don't need rocket science. It is so simple. Believe, accept, trust, and I can do it. He promises that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you allow him to do it. 22. Last chapter. Last chapter, final two blessings. 22, verse 7 and 14. The Bible tells us that these sayings are faithful and true. Someone read for me, it's 22, 7. 22 and verse 7. Blessed is he who keeps the prophecy of this book. Why? He's coming? Do you guys still believe he's coming? Don't lose hope. He is coming. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. The Lord is true to his words. He will come. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is trying to save your family. That's why sometimes we need to think, I want Jesus to come right now. Two questions. Are you ready? Do you have friends and family who are ready? You see, sometimes we want him to come for selfish reasons. We want him to come so we don't got to pay back our student loans and our bills. But that's not the reason why he should come. No, no, that's very selfish. We want to escape earth. No, he's saying, if I do come, maybe you might not make it. If I do come, your garments are sold. If I do come, your daughter might be lost. Your son might be lost. Your friends might be lost. So why do you want me to come right away? Yes, I do want him to come. But for his own graciousness, I should say, thank you, God, for giving me one more day for me personally to get right and also for me to be able to share it with someone else. Even in his delay, there is grace. And finally, verse 14. As Jesus is saying he is coming, he's reminding us that just like in the beginning in chapter 1, he says, Beliah, we have to keep or do or live out or practice these things that we are teaching. What good is it for him to say again, believe and you will not perish, and people don't believe. That's disobedience. It's a very simple thing. But you still disobeyed anyhow. Because he said, if you believe, if you accept what I've done, if you confess and forsake your sins, you will be saved. If you call upon his name, you will be saved. He has made it so easy. And all we have to do is to put the faith in that work that has already been complete, and yet people wouldn't obey it. Because that is a command, by the way. To believe is a command. We want to work the works of God. Jesus once told the people that followed him, he said, this is the work of God that you believe. Believing is a work. How easy is that? 22, 14, it says what? Blessed are those who keep or do his commandment. What's the result? That they may have a to the tree of? Oh, man, I want to have a right to that tree of life. I want to be eat. I want to eat a different fruit every month. How about you? I don't know what kind of fruit they'll be. Yesterday, I bought some persimmons. They were so good. I almost had to hold myself back for being gluttonous because they were so good. But I don't know if there's going to be persimmons there. I don't know if there's going to be mangoes. Whatever it is, I know that whatever it is and whatever type of fruit it is, it's going to be good. Can you imagine that? Even God is like encouraging us. Listen, month number one, this fruit. Month number two, ah, you probably get tired. Let's go on to another fruit. Man, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Rejoicing. Even after I'm saved, even after you're in the kingdom, we still say, thank you, Lord. Because I didn't know it was going to be this good. I mean, I thought I read about it, but Lord, thank you. Can you imagine just maybe seeing, you know, Jesus passing by? Thank you, Lord. Go about your business. You see him again coming back. Thank you, Lord. Look at my Savior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here I am. Got a mansion. Streets of gold. Like, I'm actually experiencing it right now. No pain in my body. Oh, man, look at it. You know, I can't feel no extra weight. It's like everything is perfect. Proportion is like, whoa, no Jenny Craig up in here. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we've only been here 2,000 years. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We still got eternity to go. Thank you, Lord. Blessings upon blessings. And he's telling us to tell this to the rest of the world. Then you jump down to the rest of it. He says, if you are thirsty now, 
Come. He's making one final appeal. Come. Are you thirsty? Come. 15. Thirsty. Are you come? Drink. Who is inviting us? Now he says it's not only him. He said, Spirit and the bride say, Come. You are the bride. Who is supposed to tell him, Come? You tell him, Come. Are you thirsty? Do you need a relationship that is meaningful, significant? Come. Come. Come to Christ. This morning, will you come? Will you come? Are you searching for meaning, significance? Will you come? Will you give your life this morning to Jesus Christ so that he can fill you up? Jesus is an extravagant God. He's a liberal God. He gives it liberally, just dishes it out. You want to be blessed? Come, I got so much for you. Why are you waiting? I invite you to come.